call the meeting to order. Um, we don't have anybody wishing to address the board, I believe, on agenda items, so we'll move on to the district priorities review. I don't watch it. Okay, just for sale. Well, welcome everybody. <laughs> Happy Monday. We um, have the agenda um, on here, and just to kind of refresh everybody's minds of what this point of the year is, it's hard to believe it's already mid year. And so, when we set our district priorities um, back for this year, and if you remember, we're in that continuous improvement cycle where we come back now mid year in addition to the reports that you get during board meetings. Um, this is kind of where we come together and start looking at next year already, which seems like a long ways off to the fast as this year's gone so far. Are you having yeah, tech, tech issues? Um, as fast as this year has gone, we know that um, next year will be upon us very quickly. And with that, we're also gearing up for budget season, for um, looking at anything that we want to tweak, revise, um, just kind of think about in terms of how we articulate our priorities um, going into next year. Some of the language in that document may stay exactly the same as the work progresses. Other things we might say, you know what, let's just give something a bit more definition. Maybe something can even come out because it's well underway or um, depending on kind of where we are this year, we may not need to make that uh, a priority in the same way. So this is our opportunity to have those conversations. We have a PowerPoint, but it's just to guide our discussion. We're gonna give you an update just kind of on where we are big picture for the priorities and um, then have a chance for you to have a conversation with us about just that document and kind of the language there. Then we're going to relate that into what does that mean for any budget considerations? Are there things that you want us to be thinking about? Are there things that we want to make sure that you've kind of got on your radar as we're formulating all that? But as you know, um, departments are already working on bringing forth the things that we think need to have consideration. Todd will just briefly review the budget process. I think you're all familiar with it. Um, as Mark goes his first cycle this year, um, we just want to make sure that we're all tracking that together. But having been in our school district for many, many years, Mark, I know you, you know how the budget works, but it's just good to kind of all review. Then um, we'll do just a little bit of board development. I said I would just um, do some things to kind of uh, give you a, a picture of what we've done with our administrators this year, doing some leadership development using the Brene Brown work and just some of the things that have been beneficial in our own development and our own thinking. And we'll do a little bit of that together. And then we'll have food and have a chance to eat before we have our, our board meeting. So um, with that, we'll just get started. So our um, district priorities this year have really served us well. It serves as a great roadmap. Um, we keep a, a dashboard within our departments. We update each other on a monthly basis, and so we can always kind of take a look at where we are. We use just a really simple system of red, yellow, green to, to note what's moving as expected, what's a little slower, and what's maybe um, not started yet or um, maybe is waiting on something else. It doesn't have a value judgment as good, bad, or you know, indifferent, but it just helps us kind of gauge and, and collectively be accountable with each other with our work. So um, this is just that mid-year progress update. So as a reminder, the first area is academic success, and we're not gonna go through all the language of this. I'm gonna turn it over to um, Dr. Boyson and um, just remind us of the initiatives, and I'll let you walk us through all this, uh, yeah. Teresa. And then in each section, what we've done is just kind of giving you a bulleted list of an overview of kind of some of the big accomplishments to this point as far as our progress indicators and then um, what we see is kind of recommended work and then we'll talk a little bit about does that mean an actual change in the language of that document or can it stay as is to still reflect the work so that's that's kind of what we've done and i have a clicker if you want to click, like click your Thank own you. slides I like to be the driver c-y-o-s <laughs> 
All right, good afternoon. So I will go through the academic success area. So under academic success, we have three initiatives. One is the implementation of the Sioux Falls multi-tiered system of support. The second one, maybe. Is it going? No. Uh, turn it on the side. Click on. Make it green. The second one is um, college and career readiness skills, and the third, facilitate targeted professional development in line with our district priorities, so I'll break those down for you. And here's the definitions of each one, and again, we'll go through our progress under the multi-tiered system of supports, college and career readiness, and targeted professional development. And we have indicators in each one of these areas. And based on those indicator, progress indicators, um, we have where we are within that implementation. So the progress indicators for the implementation of MTSS, um, that multi-tiered system of supports. Um, starting last summer, we gathered perceptual data from all of our buildings to decide on where we start with that progress or that process, and then based on that information, we've implemented five MTSS trainings throughout the year. We've completed two of those. Our third one's scheduled for February. We have another one in March, and then in June, we have a full day um, where every building will bring a team for that MTSS training, and it really looks at shared leadership, team alignment, um, building capacity, pro the problem-solving process, and evidence-based um, practices. So we'll move through that, and then we are um, going to start this summer with a PBIS training. So each building will have a PBIS team, which is part of their MTSS team, and that's Positive Behavior Intervention and Supports. And that training will happen in June. Their building's MTSS team will add a per any person that they have, maybe it's a counselor or a behavior facilitator or somebody that's um, really in tune with those behavior supports within that building. And we'll do a tier one data systems training. We'll engage in supervision, creating common language in the building and responding to behavior. And that fits under that MTSS umbrella. If you think about MTSS, academics and behavior, this is the behavior part of that. And so we'll start with that training for the team in June. And other things we have um, continued to develop within that, under that first initiative, is looking at professional learning, research-based literacy practices. That's our focus in K-5. Um, we deep dive with those two extra days in August. And then the middle school and high school had that Kagan student engagement training. And we continue on with that next week on Monday. We're going to do some more literacy work with K-5 and then student engagement with, uh, with the middle school and the high schools working on some things with Brene Brown, so, or the high school is. And so really looking at additional work there. And then pyramid of supports, and that's that MTSS framework at all levels. We're doing the intervention and enrichment blocks. So at elementary, that looks like implementing of the SIPs um, for the young students and with Hagerty for that phonemic awareness, focusing on reading strategies. We have math interventions with that Bridges curriculum and really looking at that consistency across the district and then collecting the data in Infinite Campus to track how our students are doing. And um, Doug and Nicole's team have worked to develop that. So starting third quarter, teachers will be putting their data in there just to house the information. It won't be on the report card, but it's just to keep a common platform so we can look at that across the district. At middle school, um, they're really working to create an intervention and enrichment block within their schedule, focusing on results from formative assessments and then talking about that during collaboration. And there also was an additional teacher and an EA hired at the middle school level to help with um, those interventions and enrichment for students. And at high school, all high schools have created an intervention and enrichment block, and it looks a little bit different at all four high schools, but they're monitoring that 
and they're evaluating the progress in those areas. And high school was allotted two teachers and two EA, and EA to help support in that area also. And then special education is looking at um, results-driven accountability, and they're going through their accreditation right now and really looking to see how their supports are helping all students. And our English language work, we've worked at aligning that English language development classes to the, the can-do indicators with the WIDA access assessment. And so looking at accountability there and really, again, how are we doing across the district to support all students. Another um, support, we added map reading fluency at the K-2 level, and it looks at that phonemic awareness, really that nice alignment with the SIPs to make sure that we're moving ahead and we're identifying the students that we need to. They just have given their second assessment right before Christmas, so um, looking at that information as we move forward. Uh, yes? On the EL forefront, by adding the additional um, administration position for that, have mm -hmm. we seen more ability for the, um, all the elementary, for example, buildings to have more standardized type of EL? Um, yep. Yep, that's a good question. So um, Sarah really is working at looking at how we um, allocate staff and looking at the amount of services that they're getting and making sure that we're meeting that requirement. And we did have some good news last week. The state and the federal government um, put in new criteria, so we exited 65 additional students, so then that helps to bring down the caseload at those levels. And then Sarah was able to do this alignment with the quarterly assessments. And so we'll see the results of that um, as we move forward. So, and now we're just ramping up because testing starts, the access testing starts the end of the month, so. Uh, and it's that blend of if they're going to exit ELL services, but then we still have the supports that they need for probably still, you know, helping with content and supporting them depending on grade level too and what that looks like. So it's not just by now you're fluent, go and figure it out. Exactly. So it's that good blend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And our second indicator is college career readiness. And, and so I'm gonna pause you. Yep. Any other questions just about that's a big chunk and Dr. Fedden is here too, so she can answer any questions that you have. I just wanted to we'll stop with each spot. Any other things with that? Okay. okay, sorry. Nope. So college and career readiness is that second indicator. And under that we had the technology to support student engagement and learning. Um, and Emmett's here also if you have any questions regarding this implementation. But the implementation of the interactive view boards and panels, they've been installed at all high schools. And we have Patrick Edison and Axtell yet to be installed and along with that comes the training that for all teachers you know they think that they can use this is a view board here they um, get specific training on how to engage students in, so we're not just using it as a um, large screen TV that just to project information on and so those will continue and then we'll start with elementary next year and so the question was, why aren't we just putting them in all elementaries during the summer? And then that way we're ready to go for the fall. We want to make sure that they get the training along with the view board because if you put this in my room, I come, I don't think I need training because I know how to turn it on and use it. But we want that training to go hand in hand with the implementation. So we'll start with those next year. Audio enhancement equipment, um, we started with elementary for the audio enhancement equipment and all the elementaries on the east side of the interstate have, they've been installed and are using them. We're starting in the central part um, today or this week to get those installed. And so that has been a great benefit and the teachers can just pick up and use those. And they have commented on how it has helped engage the students in the classroom. You think that everybody's hearing, but they're not. So, so it's been a good addition. And multiple pathways and career connected learning. When we look at that, um, the new website will have the career clusters and the pathways listed out there when that is deployed. We're also working towards opportunities to have um, 
multiple pathways in the special education area. Um, Nikki Whiting gave that board report um, about a month ago on Project Search, and that's really working on the readiness skills with students for disabilities. Um, looking at an early childhood opportunity at CTE to expand credentials for middle school and high school um, opportunities and really trying to get CTE into that middle school experience for students so that way they know what's out at CTE prior to high school registration. So we'll continue to work on those pathways and you'll see something come up here um, with a recommendation for a K-12 career coach and that career or counselor and they can help streamline those pathways and get information to students even earlier. And one of the things we looked at last week was aviation and that pathway and they said we really need to talk to kids in middle school and so we know that so how do we um, again get those opportunities to kids ahead of time. And then Jobs for American Graduates, JAG. Um, the JAG program is currently um, finishing it the first semester at Roosevelt High School with 10 students and they've had some great feedback for us. We met with the state representative, the teacher, and Mr. Hazlett about a month ago to talk about JAG and what it's done for those kids and the leadership opportunities and we're having a conversation tomorrow with the other three high schools about expanding JAG into all high schools for next year. So we're excited about that opportunity. Um, dual credit. Dual credit extends, expanded at the high school level. We added speech. We're looking at government for next year. CTE has um, the option to offer Math 100 and English 100. And we and last year we had 333 students participate in dual credit opportunities. So that's 70 additional students over the prior year. And I believe this year will be even higher. Um, college algebra is the one that really has grown that opportunity and we're looking at opportunities for um, the in the language arts area also and one of the things the counselors have talked about is the work that's required when you enroll in a dual credit opportunity the meeting with a parent and the mm -hmm. students because there there's work that you need to do on the college side but then there's work you need to do at the high school level too and we visited with USD about that and they will have an advisor that's available for the high schools during those high peak times that will rotate between the four high schools and so that's a great benefit. That's great because I mean Charlie my that's son hard. has been struggling to get <laughs> this all figured out so it would be wonderful if yeah. there's some support. Yeah and the timelines are different you know they start before we do in August and so the work needs the paperwork needs to be completed and then they start class before we start and so it's all of those lining up to make sure the students have what they need. But that's, that's something that I know, I mean, that's just not a Sioux Falls issue. That's something that we need to pay attention to statewide and just how hard do we make it for kids to do that dual enrollment process. And if you have you know, family members who haven't ever engaged in that college going process, that's pretty intimidating. And we're thinking about that after having some of our community forums. What are some of those supports that we can layer in for for families who may not be very familiar with that and trying to make that easier. And am I correct that we that uh, one of our institutions was adding some supports next year? That's USD. Yeah. They're, yep, they're gonna offer, they offered an advisor that can rotate between the buildings to yeah. help set appointments for families so they can meet with them to help mm -hmm. support them. So yes. Where we can then add an interpreter, a liaison, or just somebody else who can then yeah. help after that initial meeting. So yeah. I think I think that's just a such an important thing and we've talked about that and it comes up in many different conversations whether it's from an economic standpoint or from an academic standpoint it's a benefit to our kids and what I hear the most is our kids are behind what a, a student from Minnesota can accumulate during high school so that's something we have to keep paying attention to. We layer that with if we are able to push it down to the 10th and 9th right. grade ability and also allowing the classes to be um, on a registrar or syllabus yeah. early enough so that when the kids register in February for August classes, they can actually mm -hmm. do it instead of having to re-register again once the DOE releases those. Right. right. That so. just came up in, in our conversation the other day about um, enhancements to our aviation program is if a student can nudge down to that sophomore or summer after sophomore year, they're not technically 
um, categorized yet as a junior, but how can we give some flexibility there so that they can get on that right pathway with the course progression, knowing that that's a heavy load. And so that's something we want to keep nudging on with the State Department. Mm -hmm. Good. And our last one on here is increased language acquisition and cultural knowledge. Um, we have added Spanish for Spanish speakers to the high school, which includes the option for heritage Spanish speakers um, to join Spanish immersion at the middle school level. Um, we're adding ASL, American Sign Language 3 and 4 at Washington, and then we're planning for the two-way immersion students to enter middle school in 2025, so really what's that going to look like? And then also opportunities at the middle school level will be adding the Lakota language into that middle school cycle. And so that's just um, some different opportunities that are up and coming. Any questions about that area or other comments? No, I just think it's um, really important that you mentioned even like pushing down some maybe certificate opportunities or getting middle school kids um, prepared. And I think when we, one of the big issues in our community is child care in general. And so helping to prepare some of those students who may go on to work at daycares or, or do any sort of child development types of things I think is a great opportunity give those kids in middle school some additional responsibility and an opportunity to earn a little money, you know, whether it's for themselves or for their family, but to better prepare them for those jobs that we really need to keep our workforce going in the fall, too. I can't even tell you the number. You guys can probably also think of people that you know whose kids have, their daycares have been closed for a week here or two weeks there, or just the room was closed because of people being sick and, and things like that. So it really is a crisis. So I think how we can help the community Right. The next one is our indicator three is increased targeted professional learning. And we'll start with our Inspire Educational Conference, used to be the summer symposium, and we're moving ahead. We haven't been able to hold it for two years. We're going to hold it in August um, this summer. And so really looking at how, and it's open to any educator in the Sioux Falls School District, our educational assistants, our clerical, anybody that wants to attend. We'll have um, um, focused on academics, but we'll also have that supporting that educator wellness in there, which would be appropriate for our educational assistants and our classroom teachers. And then as part of that, we will do um, an unconference, mm -hmm. which came apart from our crowd loop and really what that is is the educators that are interested in talking to other area educators in an area of interest they all come together in a classroom and and they just put sticky notes up under different areas and then those teachers go and meet together and and really talk about social emotional learning or if it's um, teaching government so then I'm going to talk to all my other government teachers and so it really lets them self-direct their learning in that area so that's an inspire education conference and then micro credentialing um, continue to look at targeted professional learning for all employee groups and we're meeting with uh, we've met three times now with a company and we're looking to move forward with a pilot group on micro credentialing for this spring semester where um, staff can earn three credits um, and really it's in the area of educator well-being we're going to start with that one to pilot it and then gain their feedback and what micro credentialing does is allow teachers to have that professional learning and earn credits on their own at the right time for them so if the right time for me is four o'clock in the morning i can log on i can pres i can load in my evidence and an outside person vets that and make sure that I have the right evidence in there. If not, they give me feedback and I have to go back at my assignment again and resubmit. And then, um, so we want to get feedback from teachers on that, on how that works and do they like the process. And so starting with a small pilot group of 15 to 20 teachers will really give us that feedback. That also gives us a process that gives us kind of a visible archive, if you will, of who's had extra training or has expertise in a particular area as we build teacher leadership and that allows them then when we have those conferences to be people that we can call on to say, hey, would you do a session on this or 
if a new teacher is struggling with something and we need a master teacher who has kind of some added layers it's something that's um, not easy to get going once you do though the the districts that I know of that have gotten pieces of it going it really kind of starts to be this self feeding kind of a um, layer that's really good to have in a district it, it just lends itself well to so many other things so hopefully that'll take off nicely and then again in here we have the MTSS implementation this year is really building that infrastructure and with full implementation um, for the fall of 2022 uh, we do have the new higher academy at all three levels so our, our coordinators at each level with their instructional coaches have the new higher academy and that new higher academy they meet with new teachers every six weeks to talk through what's coming up now and how to support them just in the right time and we've had some nice feedback from the teachers because we can't just give them all the information at the beginning of the year but if we can spread that out it helps support them and then it brings the new teachers back together as a cohort also um, if I don't have another new teacher in the building but I get to know you and you're at another building it just helps build that support and then the technology implementation and professional learning that's with our view boards um, we continue to have that professional learning they go through the first two sessions when they're together when that new board view board is rolled into their classroom and then we'll come back and spiral a uh, third training for those teachers next year that have had the first and the second and then administrator professional learning you know our new administrators go through special education training they go through the EL PSYOP training every year we have the leadership training that helps with um, drop-in visits and formal evaluations crucial conversations the leadership development Institute and really looking at how we develop our leaders um, through there and we'll continue on that process and through the micro credentialing process there is a administrator leadership so that could be something for aspiring leaders that if they want to take that prior to applying to be a intern or a building principal that might be available too so just looking at some of those um, credential stacks and then um, we have student-centered coaching that we're continuing to work on with our instructional coaches um, we're really looking at student-centered coaching it's to build that capacity and looking at how do we move forward with teacher professional development based on student um, feedback and student growth and so that's our focus we'll come we'll have some more information for you on that later in the next couple months and then the whole child data system looking at a with the MTSS process building teams want to be able to pull I want to pull this group of students and we'll look at their academics their behavior um, any interventions and so we've really looked at some different platforms to support that system and then also um, Doug and his team have built some different views in Tableau the current system that we do have so at this point um, the dashboards that they're able to provide through Tableau we're going to stick with Tableau to see um, how that supports our staff as we move forward and then recommendations for next year based on priority areas um, our k-12 career counselor that's under initiative two college and career readiness um, looking at MTSS PBIS coach for building level teams really um, how do we continue to support that implementation those teams have to meet every month to six weeks and who's in there to help support that and to make sure they're going down that right path jobs for American graduates at all high schools so um, increasing that JAG opportunity at all high schools that does take a little additional staffing um, to make sure that that teacher has time to meet and connect with with employers and speakers to come in to support that expansion of early learning opportunities into community sites Elizabeth's really looking at that and how do we move that forward there's some other things that go with that but again that's just an option for expansion and then career exposure through job shadow experiences we used to have a job shadow person th through forward Sioux Falls and that was cut probably two or three years ago which reduced I mean we had buildings that had 300 job shadows run through one high school and when that was cut the exposure to students for other careers so really working with that team and having some conversations about bringing that back 
and then a K-12 computer science pathway um, starting at the, you know, we know we have that partnership with DSU in the high school out at CTE. We have great dual credit opportunities, but how do we get that, that back down into middle school and then into elementary? And then the home language literacy development for EL students um, looking at how do we help families develop their literacy um, if they have an EL student. So just exploring that opportunity, Sarah's working on that to see what we can do to support families and then that works in that college and career readiness and community engagement sessions. Questions before we move on? Those are a lot and so when we think about the work that's already being accomplished this year and the cycle that comes in with that, the, the K-12 computer science pathway is one that's really important. It's one that's going to be a little tricky for how we get that K-5 strand built out, um, knowing that it probably will be a combination of some online opportunity facilitated by an instructor because not everybody is doing coding, not everybody is, you know, kind of in that computer science mindset at an elementary level, and then it's how do we work that into the school day, the school week, knowing what else we're trying to accomplish with reading and math primarily, and then science and social studies, and then it's how do we divvy up those minutes. So um, between that and then hopefully adding some more after school enrichment opportunities in that STEM computer science area is another way that we can kind of build that out outside of the school day. So um, that one's going to be interesting. We have a team already working on how that can happen. And they do have a micro-credential stack on computer science literacy. That's what they're called as stacks, uh -huh. which means just the progression of, right. of trainings that you go through that then earn you the badge. Yeah. That's kind of the language that goes with that. Right. Yeah. Um, maybe this will be underneath a, a different area, but I'm just wondering with, with um, the research it shows that second to parental involvement is that parent-teacher relationship in measuring student achievement. I'm wondering which indicator speaks to number one class size and then number two teacher salary, specifically those providing direct support to students. That's something we can probably talk about when we get into the fiscal area and if there's something that we want to see reflected differently and that's also part of the budget process when Todd gets into that section. Excellent. Yep. Thank you. Yep. All right, Dr. Nold. The next area in, is my box. Good. Okay. Uh, the next area in the area of well-being, uh, you did have a, a more in-depth dive into this in the early part of December there. Um, so I will go through some of these things again. If you have questions, obviously I'd be happy to, to follow up on that. But some of these things you will see that are continued on from that time in the presentation there. And so this area here is really looking at that sense of belonging for our students and our staff and the supports that are needed for our students and staff to be able to be successful. And uh, we look at both the academics and the social aspect of that when we're talking about the student success. And so in the first area here, there were the four initiatives that I've gone through with you as well. The first one on there has to do with the multi-tiered system of supports. This carries over in, into both areas. It carries over, obviously, in the academic success of the students and, and into the well-being of the students. We refer to it a lot of times as the academic and then the behavioral. Um, we'll probably refer it that way separate, less and less. Uh, and just all over, it covers the multi-tiered system of supports. It's going to help students in both ways. The second area of that is the supports for the students, the families, and the staff, and the access to those. And I'll talk a little bit and remind you again on those areas. The third being the review and alignment programs uh, that provide some of those intensive supports. We've, we've been having several meetings going through, and you'll see part of that that will come through in the budget process here, of looking to, to be able to really improve some of those supports for our students that need those. Uh, and that'll be an ongoing process as we work through the MTSS process and, and we strengthen our Tier 2 programs within the schools. And it may call on some of the, some of the supports outside of the schools uh, or alternative programs to become uh, less needed, hopefully, as we provide more of those supports within the school setting. The fourth one on there, provide targeted professional development and equip our staff uh, to be able to meet those student needs, and we'll go through that as well. So those are the four initiatives in the area of well-being. Uh, 
the multi-tiered system of supports, a lot of that, as we talked about, is, is ongoing training. And, and as shown in December there, this is really a two to four year implementation process. As we go through in this first year, uh, we've had three of those meetings, as Dr. Boyson had alluded to. There's three more upcoming, culminating at the end of this year with a, a full day training where each school will bring their team together for a full day tra training that we have at the end of the year. And so this part of it, uh, really looking at those first two bullets with the PBIS, and Dr. Boyson alluded to that as well with the training that'll happen uh, for each of our schools that'll have a team. They'll be part of that PBIS training. In the meantime of that, we still have in the, in the third bullet, uh, build staff and teacher capacity to manage student behavior. There's so many of the trainings that they're going through at the individual school level that we have building-wide or district-wide, but they're also accepted within the buildings. Uh, part of that training deals with the well-managed schools, the Boys Town model, uh, some of those trauma-informed schools, zones of regulation, uh, the second step, leader and me. But truly, to be able to have an overall district program would be the PBIS. And so we will look at that and work through that. Uh, it still will include all those other trainings that staff have had, but just to be able to have that common language when you go from the elementary to the middle school to the high school. And so that training will be a district-wide training with the PBIS, but still using those individual things that the buildings see as specific needs for their building. The fourth bullet on there provide training on student assistance team. Uh, as I talked about in early December, that part it, it will be an ongoing process with the MTSS implementation. So we did have that as a separate aspect. We put that on hold until we go through the whole process with the MTSS. And so we need to look at those student assistance teams, but that's gonna look different now as we go through the MTSS process as to what are the evaluations that are needed, what uh, metrics are needed for each one of those teams so we can very, be very consistent throughout the entire district. So that part specifically with the trainings on hold until we, we get the full implementation of the MTSS process going through. And again, um, that's a two to four year process that we will utilize. So one significant pack, uh, factor of this is, is the multi-tiered systems of support. Another area is that student staff uh, and family supports. And so really looking at that, we're, we're working through the website to have that be a central hub. And the website as we had updated, we are working through the vendor at this point in time and, and working to get that updated so that on the website, students will be able to access, staff will be able to access and, and, and any of those supports that they would be able to need. So that's an access uh, situation. We actually have had some additional conversations even today with some local providers on, on doing even uh, partnerships with them to be able to do monthly access and, and things like that just to be able to provide those supports for our families. It goes a lot in line with uh, what Becky Dorman has been doing with the employee assistance program. That's the staff side of it and that information that she has put out there and, and obviously working uh, that a certain percent of our staff are utilizing to put that information out. It goes out in monthly newsletters. It goes out to staff when they're hired. Uh, and so we continue to put that in front of our staff so that they know and they feel comfortable utilizing that. And it, it's showing a continued uptick in, in use as we go throughout this school year. Uh, and then develop that community support center, which is over at Axel Park. Uh, that's a work in progress as we uh, continue to build those parts. We partnered along with our EL programming, so the testing, the intake process, so that some of our families become very comfortable going there. Homeless, uh, our social workers that work with the homeless families is stationed out of there and works very closely in that uh, student support center. And we're gonna continue to add things there. Uh, we also have a, a grant that'll be coming through the state, uh, dollars that come there that are homeless ed dollars through ESSER. And we'll look to try to bolster that as well. So we really make that a hub that people can go to to get the resources that they would need. The next area in there is partnerships. Uh, I talked a little bit about that, but we did uh, at the point in time talk with the Native American students and the work that we have done with that uh, teacher on special assignment that was added or the TOSA that was added, this broken leg that, that works through that process. And the work that she is doing with the schools to be able to bring consistency across the schools. We saw some schools that had very advanced programming, some that needed to update their programming. So she's working through with all those schools to be able to do that. Implementation of the practices to support that uh, student attendance. That is an ongoing process and transportation obviously and communication 
the mentoring was a portion of that where we, we do see uh, the uptick in the number of mentors. Uh, we need to do that <coughs> even more significantly. A year ago, uh, that stayed steady because we just couldn't have the mentors coming into the school, so it was difficult. We tried a lot of different avenues, but obviously that helps immensely to be able to have our mentors come in. And just even as a testimony with my own parents, it was very difficult with the technology, but they love being in person uh, when they go in and see their mentors. So that's an aspect of it that we hope to continue to work on and grow. The legislation part of that, uh, as you know, we're coming into the legislative season, season right now and we're meeting consistently with some legislators to try to take some of those things forward and potentially even some study groups to be able to look at the attendance aspect and how that's impacted by the laws as well and, and how we can bolster that. Because a big piece of that is, is we don't uh, look to incarcerate students, uh, especially on, on attendance, but we do need to improve that because it'll lead to other things if they're not in school gaining an education and they're missing school, it'll lead to other uh, crimes or involvement that they'd be into that are negative for them. And we want them to be in school to get an education. The review and recommend changes to our behavior support. Uh, we have a group and a committee of about 30 people that have been going through at the middle school level and high school level, looking and working on many of those changes and that'll come through in the budget process upcoming here. But a lot of those changes will work uh, much like we did with the Joe Foss program, and that we, we saw many changes there to give kids more opportunities. That same uh, aspect will be taking place with our behavior programs, and then working with a couple entities to come in and provide training, so we have consistency in those programs. We took a group down to visit another program in Lincoln Public Schools, and that was a big thing that we saw when we went on that uh, trip to be able to learn was, was just the consistency factor of being able to go from the elementary to the middle school to the high school and the training that took place in that. And the other important piece to that, and I alluded to that a little bit earlier with one of our partners and having conversations with the mental health aspect. And can we bolster those uh, services at those sites and, and some of that you'll see coming through. Some of it will be some partnerships that won't cost us money. Some of it will be a few things that are added into the recommendations for uh, expenditures for the next budget season. And then expand the number of caring adults connected students. That's our Professional development, um, we've talked quite a bit on that and Dr. Boyson has as well. And I went through uh, many of the things that we have done with both the administration and our teachers with professional development. But we really have that, the other component of that it, that was maybe not touched on is the training that, that um, Patty Lake Torbert is doing with our counselors and social workers. And they're continually going through the hatch uh, lessons and the training and, and really to bolster that because we've not had that consistent uh, programming in our elementary has not been updated and, and unified for quite a few years. And so she is going through and working with our elementary counselors to provide that training. And uh, that's probably where the most significant changes are coming in um, with our elementary and then it'll work up through the middle school and high school. So we do have those progress indicators that we have listed under each one of those areas. Um, there's there's three or four under each, and I've gone through those extensively when we went through in December. Um, I will go to this next slide and come back to it, but the progress indicators, just to give you an update on part of this here, you know, we provided that full report in December. Some of the things that we're going to be working on here coming up that, that are priorities for the 22-23, we need to continue that, obviously, that MTSS process. It's a two to four year process. It's going to impact so many areas as we go through, both in the academic areas in the behavioral areas, uh, the well-being of our students. Uh, it'll help our student assistance teams uh, as they go through. And, and obviously, one of our goals, we just went through the elementary, um, that we want to make sure that we have the right students placed in that tier three programs and to go through that evaluation process. And if we can provide those supports to keep those students in the tier two in the buildings that we provide those supports in elementary, but obviously look at that tier three when it's, when it's needed. That's going to take a couple years as we go through uh, really right now most of it is in a training phase with our administrators and the first time that that true team will come together for the training they've been going back to the buildings working with their team the mtss team but the first time we'll bring together as a whole group is, is that time in, in june when we have uh, every team represented from the district then we also have uh, the implementation and evaluation because so much of this is new but that support center that's over at Axdale Park and what things do we, are we able to utilize there? What do we need to change and, and bolster? Uh, the supports to meet the unique needs of all students. 
and a lot of that will truly go into our, our behavior programming at Axel Park for our middle and high school, um, elementary, middle, and high school, but really a lot of that significant change is gonna come through, and you'll see that in the budget process with our, our middle and high school and the behavior programs that are in tier three. And then the targeted professional develop to equip staff there's quite a few that will be coming through, and a lot of that, uh, thankfully, will be part of that ESSER dollars that can be used for professional development, and that will be at all levels. Uh, some of that you have seen as we go through because the Kagan strategies, for, for example, uh, if you're able to utilize those in a classroom to keep your students engaged and involved, you see fewer off-task behaviors that start to lead towards other things within the disruption of a classroom. And so many of those things, it may not be specifically written in the well-being, but overall it does impact all these areas as we go through. So we'll continue to do that with the, the professional development and find that out over the next two years with many of those uh, trainings and PBIS, the Kagan strategies, uh, some of the other training that we will go through with our behavior programs from the elementary, middle school, and high school that we saw consistency uh, that was introduced on the Lincoln Public Schools. So that's part of that. Uh, one of the areas that we do have listed on here as far as a, a new area, and Dr. Boyson alluded to this, the K-12 career counselor to support our students. Um, worked with, with Patty Lake Torbert quite a bit on this as well. And we come from a, two different aspects, the academic aspect and also the behavioral because if we can help those students see what are some of the careers that they can go into at a younger age, uh, we believe that could give them some focus in the middle school. Obviously, part of that will be to expand some of those offerings in the middle school especially in the area of tech, uh, the career tech avenue, uh, but a career counselor can help to, to coordinate some of those things as we go through. <coughs> so some of these things in the budget you'll see coming through that'll help with our services at our alternative locations, um, and then part of that you'll see just as ongoing with the MTS, MTSS process. Questions you may have, I know quite a bit of this you have heard within the, just over a month ago, but any other questions for that? Okay. This is this is all of us kind of going over this. Um, set that there because I can do this. This area, as you know, was an intentional area so that we keep um, doing those practices that help us connect on multiple levels with our community. And so um, part of that was really making sure that we're strengthening our existing partnerships and defining what those are some of them needed a little bit more definition with the terms of a partnership the duration kind of who a point person was what the outcome was um, intended to be so we've been working on that um, also making sure that we have a really good process for how we engage with our stakeholders whether it's students staff community last year remember we did some extensive listening at the building level this year we have our community forums that we've been conducting and we'll continue to do that. And um, we'll talk about a little bit in kind of things that we're working on right now, but really making sure that's part of the fabric of our district. This is about um, that Sioux Falls School District experience, customer service, what's that parent experience like? What is it like if you're new to our district? Um, what is that like if you're involved in activities and athletics, all of those things that make up the fabric of um, what it is to be a student and, and experience a Sioux Falls School District. So this was um, included in language. I think we talked about um, quite a few of these already. And the, the workforce piece is really a big part of this bigger picture of partnership in our community. We have our event coming up this Friday that's our um, celebration of a lot of those partnerships and as I looked over the list so many of them have to do with career development or student experience or connecting with kids to keep them engaged so that they will graduate and be able to um, choose a career and so all of this is really I think so critical to everything that we do academically as well as with uh, keeping our students involved and so um, when we look at our progress indicators and we look at where we are with that, um, we have um, the breakfast, like I said, coming up. We've added Rebecca Wimmer with uh, the Director of After School Partnerships and, or After School Programming and Community Partnerships to be um, really doing that intentionally. Like I said, our community forums, 
CrowdLoop was a tool that we used first semester. We'll hopefully be putting that out in the next um, couple of weeks, what the winner, if you will, was um, for how we use that information and what new initiative will come from that. We'll be able to do that next year too and, and hopefully keep building that out. Um, and then just that big picture of district feedback. How do we ask for feedback from our district? Is it surveys? Is it big questions? Crowd loop, community forums, climate surveys that we'll need to do this spring. Some of that got um, stalled from the year of uh, COVID onset and so we're just trying to give that overall plan definition so that we know year over year here's how we do these different pieces and what we take from them. Um, our new website as you know got somewhat delayed uh, but that's coming this spring. Right now I believe it's February, March-ish that we are going to start um, kind of putting things up live as well as the training that happened this fall to really get that Remind app well in place for how we do some of that two-way communication with coaches, activities, um, principals that send out quick uh, announcements. Um, and there's the uh, hiring of the director. So when we think about next year, what we want to have reflected in our district priorities, some of this will just continue. But we know one of the things that comes now that we have Rebecca in place is further building out that actual model of what our after school programs consist of with that good community learning center model as our framework. Um, looking at how we do that currently, how we can blend some things, how we can add greater efficiencies with some of our community partners and then how they might be able to expend their dollars um, for some other <coughs> things and then how can we grow that opportunity. How do we layer in more intentional enrichment? How do we make sure that every school has a quality program that um, provides academic supports, student interest, a place to be that's safe and fun? Maybe that's a two week period of time. Maybe that's every day, um, all days of the year. And, and how do we keep growing the supports for that? And um, so our, our recommendation is probably that we'll leave our existing language that's in there right now, but the initiatives will probably continue to take shape in, in some new ways. Oops, before I go on to that. Questions or comments about this area? Things are moving along nicely here and we've enjoyed our community forums particularly have been, we thought they would be fun. They were probably even more fun than we thought they would be. So much so that instead of doing all new ones, second semester we're gonna do a couple of new ones and then revisit a couple of the ones that we did in the fall as follow-up. Mm -hmm. Does partnership as it pertains to mentoring, does that fall underneath your priority area or do you need to talk about the mentoring in general mm -hmm. more heavy on training and development in those areas that you could put the mentoring in? It yeah. seems to be so critically important with those yep. interactions to address the support of each individual student. Yep. I would say right now we've characterized that as kind of a shoulder partner to our work that Rebecca is starting right now because mentoring has LSS teammates, those are kind of our community partners. We know that the benefit of that and doing more of that supports well-being, but it's also directly related to partnerships. And so that's another one of those areas are where we thought of how can we make it clear, how do we help organizations kind of recover from the COVID effect where people weren't coming into our buildings to, to mentor our students and how do we keep growing that out knowing that that's a really important part. So it's both. It's reflected a little bit differently of how it supports student well-being but is also very much part of partnerships and I think it's reflected in there. If we go back to the existing language, um, let's see if we mentioned mentoring specifically in here. If we didn't, that's something that we could pay attention to. Yeah. Because it is so important. Student achievement. Mm -hmm. I'm just going back here to look and see if we say mentoring specifically, but we certainly can because it fits. Um, we don't say it. We, we talk about it to enhance opportunities, but we don't, I don't think. So we'll make a note of that. We could maybe include mentoring with more intentional language here. Yeah. I'm most excited to see our new website because as I've told parents or other community members who actually are looking for information usually on our website, I'm like, it's there. Sometimes it's just not 
where you would think it, you know, you could, it's been clunky in the past to try to find certain documents or mm -hmm. information and so forth. So I think this new rollout is really going to help ease those um, search problems that people in the community have in finding certain information. An example would be, I see there's a bill regarding, um, uh, by Representative Peterson, I think, on um, curriculum. And are all of our curriculum, when we review curriculum, who's, you know, the committees that involve parents and all that is all on our website. And mm -hmm. it's asking for transparency. Well, it's like, we are doing that, but maybe people just don't know because they haven't either mm -hmm. asked or talked to their teacher or talked to their principal to know where that information is. And we are trying to provide that. So I think with our new rollout, it might help um, some of those search mm -hmm. problems that people might have. Yeah, I would say it's probably more intuitive and much more user friendly to find information. You're right, it is there already uh, publicly available. And then the other feature that we really like is that it makes it much easier to push some of those things out or um, just kind of what's going on as we tell the stories of all of the good things that we know happen in our classrooms and in our activities and, and makes it a little bit easier to, to push out from a school level. Um, just from a user standpoint of making that website valuable to our, our patrons. So we're excited to see it. Very excited after not seeing it quite when we hope to. Good, good comments. Anything else in that area? Okay. Staff excellence and clicker will work I'm gonna part. pass that around to Becky. With staff excellence, um, with focus being uh, staff growth, building profession professional capacity, you'll see a lot of the elements um, were um, shared in our other priorities as well. Um, and this one will also have a focus on recruitment and, of course, um, retention of staff. So as we go through these, um, I'll touch on the things that we haven't talked about yet. Um, and so if we look at the second um, bullet point, our focus on recruitment, recognition, and retention. Um, HR um, shifted staff duties around to make sure that we were able to have a main focus on recruitment and retention, um, and including recognition, um, just because it is so important. And then in building our professional capacity, if we take a look at the custodial mentoring program, um, Jeff Kreider and his team had a great foundation for a custodial mentoring program um, where uh, individuals be ab were able to see some of our higher level, more complex um, custodial uh, positions. Um, we had to put that on pause a little bit here as Sioux Falls and I think probably the rest of the United States goes through a, a staffing situation, um, but we're excited to get that up and going just as soon as our staffing levels allow us to do that. And then uh, the last bullet there would be that offering that engaging job relevant training for non-teaching staff. We've done some, some new things this year. Um, we've done some diversity training with our child nutrition staff. We're planning that same type of training for our custodial staff. And then we also have um, a Cheers from Peers program that it's meant to um, help mentor our new staff, but it also builds the capacity of our current education assistants, um, showing them how to be a leader within their building and how to establish that culture that's so important um, in making everyone feel welcome and valued in their jobs. Um, one thing you may have noticed if you've been watching the district's emails is our uh, expansion of the Staff Stars program. Uh, the community relations team, Deanne, Carly, and Ben have just done an incredible job of lifting those folks up and just helping us learn more about what we all do to make school happen each day. Um, the Employee Milestone Recognition Program, we're taking some steps this year to get that started by helping schools um, recognize their folks that have been here for 5, 10, 15 years, and then next year we plan to incorporate that possibly into our recognition banquet. Um, right now we recognize the 25-year employee along with our retirees, um, but as we know, um, other generations that we have hired um, working 
25 years for one company doesn't happen anymore. So we need to make sure we celebrate all of those milestones. So we're looking forward to that rollout. And then also I mentioned Cheers from Peers onboarding program. Um, with Cheers from Peers, we've trained 30 EAs as peers across the district. And their job is when we get new EAs in their schools, they become their best friends at work, if you will, their go-to person. Um, they help them get acclimated to the school. Um, they're their sounding board when they have questions. And they also model what um, other individuals should do when you get new employees at school. So um, we did some great brainstorming with them when they came in for their training. Um, they had some great ideas, talked through some hurdles that they had when they started jobs. And then we're going to um, pull them back in this spring because we believe that once they've gone through this for several months, they're going to have some great ideas for us. And we want to make sure we incorporate those into the programs, find out what worked, what didn't work, um, and really use their great ideas. Staff innovation, we talked about that through the crowd loop. And then also I see that as a way um, when we do our cheers from peers, just gathering that data from the people who helped us implement that program. Okay. Those are our progress indicators. Of course, we want to uh, increase retention rates in all groups, especially in those hard to fill positions. Collecting that feedback, um, recruiting, recruiting our diverse employees and then those, uh, capturing those light bulb learning submissions and showing that we've actually utilized their ideas. Okay. You might remember last spring we took a look at teacher salaries and made an adjustment to the salary schedule so that we're more competitive for those entering the field of education. Um, we did the same thing this fall with our classified wages. Um, we saw what was going on in the community, and we needed to make sure that we were competitive so that we could retain the great staff that we do have. Uh, there's our Cheers for Peers, which I've talked about. And then also we've got a survey ready to go for our um, teachers that we onboarded. This is the largest class of onboarded teachers that we've had in my time here, 22 years, um, and they came from all over the nation. So I'm excited to see their feedback on onboarding in Sioux Falls compared to maybe some of their other experiences um, so we can learn from it and shape what we do for fall of 2022. And then we also collected feedback um, when we're discussing our remote learning days uh, in, low of, in lieu of doing snow days, and we did that through an electronic survey. Oh, it's going out this week. Okay, great. No, we talked about it, so. Okay. There's our, our crowd loop through the Better Together initiative. And then um, Dr. Boyson talked about the unconference that came from the crowd loop. That was one of the standout ideas that I'm excited to see happen in August of 2022. And then moving forward, we want to take that idea of cheers from peers from EAs with their suggestions for changes um, and then move that with our other classified positions. Um, we want to kick that custodial mentoring program back into gear just as soon as we can, and then grow that employee milestone recognition program. And then, as Dr. Boyson um, talked before, uh, we're going to be launching the micro-credentialing. Questions? Comments in that area? I think the milestone recognition is important. Uh, there's not a lot of companies that don't It's a good way to celebrate. It just gives you more yeah. pieces in there. 
I believe our high schools our high schools do it. Um, our middle schools might as well, um, but this way. Um, well, last spring when we looked at our, our teacher pay, um, I did a lot of the same things that we did with the classified staff. We took a look at who was around us and how much they were paying, comparing our benefits to our salaries, um, looking at when our teachers do leave us, where are they going, all of those types of things. Um, so that was a lot of the same thing that we did for the classified. It just wasn't on this list because it happened last year. So those are our progress indicators that are set for this year that that is and, and going back will you go back just a couple slides too those are the things that we set out to do this year and one of the things is we're not at the end of the year where we'll also give some of the outcomes that come from those things at the end of the year this is just kind of where we are on the progress of doing those yeah, things so this current year we have retention right improvement, which would all go into salary Right, yeah. yep, that's part of that. And so that's something that we can make sure when we do an end of the year report, we can take a look at that. But that's something that we know is just part of our process in terms of looking at compensation. We know the state's doing some things with that this year that will probably have an effect on what we may do for you know additional compensation. So that's probably connected to that retention factor. That's just part of the regular processes though too, so it's not an indicator this year. Yeah, I just didn't want to, it just yep. overlooked. Yeah. Sometimes we our eyes mm -hmm. just focus so heavily on an indicator and wanting to make sure that that's yep. that was part yep. of it and it's not just an understood thing. Right. It is very Yeah, very much part of that. Which leads us right into this if we're ready to go on. Any other questions about Becky's area? Okay, go ahead, Todd. Thank you. Um so we're looking at the effective use of resources. We're seventh in the state in average teacher salary. Five of the districts ahead of us are impact aid schools, which has, have a lot more money to spend than the rest of the schools in the state. And uh, Brandon is ahead of us, and Yankton's ahead of us. Um, uh, as far as total compensation for teachers, we're fourth, and Brandon is third. So, and then the top two are, are you know, we're fourth in total, which includes benefits as well. And of course, what Becky said, we made an adjustment to our early salary that isn't showing up, and that's showing up. That'll show up this year, so we'll see how we come out this year. Um, specifically, on effective use of resources, we're uh, looking at future facility needs to accommodate growth, um, transportation, and how uh, that affects student success and engagement. Uh, enhancing the child nutrition program, and then uh, fiscal responsibility. Um, in the transportation area, we uh, are implementing a GPS system to increase student safety and provide real-time route information. Now that's uh, going on throughout the year. I mean, the, the behind-the-scenes stuff, you're not seeing any of it yet. It'll start getting piloted in the spring. Hopefully it'll be completely up and running then by the beginning of next year. And uh, that'll allow us to do some really neat things. You'll have an app that'll tell you if your bus is running late. And what it would have been nice to have that in place this year, especially with the driver shortages. But uh, it is something that we think will be out there next year. Um, Need-based transportation to increase attendance. We have a list of uh, about five or six elementary pocket areas to possibly bus in the future. A, we couldn't do it this year anyway because we don't have enough drivers. Can't you know? It's a nationwide issue but in B we are in spite of that though we do have two pilots going on that had been initiated a, a couple of years ago kind of kind of uh, had trouble through the uh, 
pandemic issue where we didn't we're utilizing buses with uh, for instance rise kids on them and we didn't want it could just stop in a neighborhood and pick up other kids but we didn't want to crowd the bus and whatnot so those two programs are kind of being reinvigorated this year i'll talk about that, those in a minute and uh and then hopefully we can see that that is working and i'll show you some positive evidence from the past and uh then maybe budget a some more of these four or five other areas that we've got as possible areas in, into the future. Um, and then implement busing before, uh, for before and after school activities. There isn't, um, that was not able to be implemented this year. We don't have enough drivers, same issue. The, the focus is gonna be on, when we do get enough drivers, on George McGovern and, and uh, Whittier to start out. Child nutrition, there's several there. I, um, I'll just uh, kind of basically touch on them. Improve meal quality to increase student participation. I'll show you here in a minute, but in participation is way up. Um, develop training. Um, they, they hired a trainer out there and make sure everybody's on board with, with what, what they need to know. That's rolling along. Uh, a five-year facility technology and equipment plan. That will be in, they'll see that in this year's budget. Um, the idea is to make sure that you don't pop up on a year and say, geez, we need $800,000 for these equipment needs. And, and uh, the, the prior year, we had only spent 100000 and the money got spent somewhere else. And so, you, so you're evening, you're, you're balancing that out is what the idea is there. So you'll see that in this year's budget, um, an outreach program to, to promote wellness and eating. And there's, uh, there's an idea next year to, to add to it to... Uh, to have their, their to have two dietitians out there to work with when kindergartners come into school, work with those families to get them, them going on that. And then a sustainability program, recycling milk containers, that is, that has been implemented, that was implemented this year. Fiscal responsibility, we uh, want to maintain financial comparisons to national districts, um, how we spent, and, and there isn't a lot of state, state districts that, that quite compare to us, but, and uh, minimize new and reduce current obligations, general fund, you know, we're, our, the, the amount of, of what we devote capital outlay funds to, to capital outlay certificates is going down, and the case has been true also for, for the bond, but that will go up when we reissue the final $50 million of our bond that was passed in 2018. Um, so those are our progress indicators. Increased participation, um, increased attendance in identified areas, increased student lunch participation rate, and uh, being in that lower quartile of home property tax payer in the district. So quickly, we can look at, at these. Um, so these are the, uh, this is kind of neat. This was SBA, it was right, bef it was right before COVID, but it, it was our very first one and it, it you know, kind of slowed down during COVID and then now this year it's kicked back up along with one at Terry Redland. So we will get those results of what's going on in those schools. But this was, they had a, a great uh, before and after there. And so this was a uh, combined, I just combined all, took what, what the principal had given us, is combined the math and the reading map scores and, and where the kids were. Before we bust those kids, 43% uh, were in the bottom quintile 12% were in the top. There was only 9% in the middle. It's kind of a reverse bell shape. Um, so the parents were getting their kids to school, were getting their kids to school, and the, the, the ones that were, wasn't a, a big issue, um, the, the busing really, not having busing in this area for SBA really hurt. Then when they were bused, um, it, it really, really looks like more of a, what you'd expect. You know, it's about a fifth of it. So you went from 43 down to 19. So, so uh, 20... 4% moved up into, into the higher quintiles. And then, so you can see the fourth, the, the second to the top quintile had a nice substantial gain, as did the top as well. So that was really neat. Not only was the attendance up, but this was the part that really struck our eyes when we looked at that. And we'll, we'll analyze that and again this year for SBA and, and uh, now Terry Redland as well. They're, they're keeping track of that. Um, on lunch participation rates, uh, school lunch is up 47 percent this year so last year we had free lunches for everybody this year we have and breakfast for everybody so you're kind of compa you're comparing apples to apples 
but uh, that's very significant. It's up almost 50 percent, and school breakfast is up 89 percent, which is unbelievable. And that's with all of these supply chain issues. That are yeah, mm-hmm. that's neat. And then uh, this is our 2021. Uh, our taxes, the the state prints these out, but but they're not out yet. Um, there's a website where we can go look that up, and I've been watching it. Uh, so this is the this is what this is the 2021. The 2022 will be up there before the session is over, and we're tenth of eleventh. We're the second to the bottom. We're at uh, eight thirty seven dollars per eight dollars and thirty seven dollars eight dollars and thirty seven. Easy to say thirty seven cents per thousand dollar valuation for homeowners. Um, the low is eight twenty five in the of our neighbors. The highest is eleven seventy seven. So we're very favorable there, and our our levies down about twelve cents in 2022. I don't know where the other districts are yet, but ours is down 12 cents, so I imagine we'll be right in that same area. Um, priority recommendations for 22-23 on facilities, uh, working with community partners to enhance after-school options at all levels. That's, that's key. Um, Rebecca Wimmer will be key in that as well as far as the programming part of it. and. And then Jeff Cryer will be key as far as uh, what we uh, need to do to add on to facilities to, to also let this happen. Um, one other one is uh, determining the community campus program. I think you, you heard Nikki's report on that a month or so ago. It's expanding, and we are looking around to possibly move that program you know, in a year or two to, to deal with the expansion. Um, transportation. So when we get this GPS and this app system up and, and whatnot, we're going to work, uh, we're going to develop a work uh, group, parents, administrators, others in, involved to revamp the transportation program to, so we can find out kids that aren't actually riding the bus and we don't have to save spots for them when they're not riding the bus. Maybe have people sign up and, and if kids are riding the bus and you'll have a badge, you'll scan in and out and all that stuff. So we can really, I think, uh, make more, you know, not even having to add so many bus routes, but you can offer more transportation because you know these kids aren't riding, so we can combine these routes and go to the you know these areas, and we can use this system to do that. Um, so that'll be neat. that'll be a neat thing we should be able to do. And then on the child nutrition side, um, train all the EAs involved with our education assistants involved with meals and students and basic customer service skills, kind of to to continue to sell the program. Versus, um, you know, take the take the take the lunch card, scan it, and, and whatnot. But, you know, really get into the customer service side of that, and that that's what I was talking about here. Utilizing the staff dietitians as a resource for families and nutritional education, and then financial responsibility. Did we have to squeeze that on? Uh, yeah, all these new all these new priorities that uh, we're talking about today, and and I'm sure the board will have some as well. Um, but get those into the five-year budget where we still have some ESSER dollars available to fund, fund these items, but then when those ESSER dollars goes away, we have to have a plan to be able to continue what we need to. Questions? Yeah. With the transportation, and now that you're, you're having Terry Redlin also track, it sounds like the scores uh, with those needs-based busing, I guess I would like to see, that's something I would like to see in the future, is some more expansion of that if it is showing more success. It, we did have a list. I think it was like about five areas that where where pockets where the kids aren't bused. Elementary, I believe they were all were, um, but they're not bused and their attendance is much lower than the rest. So we have a, about four or five more areas we can expand into if we can just get the the busing capabilities to sure. get there. And we'll do the same thing with those. You know, you get a nice before and after with 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 those schools. At least the first year you do it anyway. So yeah, that is on the list to look at. I think a couple things. I would um, I would hope that part of that transportation would also look at the special ed programs because they also have, um, when we look at having Rosa Parks and Hayward and trying to get them to a middle school site, there may be transportation issues um, with those families. So just keeping that in mind too for the fee-based programs. Um, and then I love the idea of the basic customer service skills for our EAs. Um, I think that children in general, um, they absorb how they're talked to and how they're interacted with. And, um, you know, having worked in customer
customer service for a long time. My husband used to train customer service. And so we would do stuff at home, like we just naturally say, I'd be happy to help you with that. Like that's just a normal thing in our house. And I remember distinctly driving and I asked Reagan in the back seat when she was three or four, did you, would you grab something for me? And she was like, I'd be happy to help you with that. And it just, it sounds so funny. But at the same time, like that's how we're teaching our kids to be respectful and to interact with people in the community. And so I just think what an amazing opportunity, not that our EAs not, are right now that we have right now are not polished. I'm not saying that at all, but I think there's always an opportunity for that in, in every field to really think about how are we treating people. And especially when you look at online and how people talk to each other and, and bullying and all these different things, like just an awesome, more people speaking positively and being encouraging and being respectful is never a bad thing. Mm -hmm. So I just think what a great opportunity for them to have that ability to have some training and awareness about that. And I think it just makes you kind of carry yourself in a different way too, because you feel confident mm -hmm. and you're, you're excited about stuff. So um, I really love that idea too. Every adult in our district is a connector with our kids, whether it's as you come in the door or when you're in the halls or when you're getting lunch. And we often um, assume things and we wanna just make sure that we've got systems in place that assure a level of quality and an understanding that everybody is a contributor to the quality of that school day for our kids. And so when we do that, we had bus driver training um, a couple of times this fall where we talk about you know, that system and how we engage with kids being the first and last person they see sometimes during their school day. So all of that contributes to that experience. It goes back into our Sioux Falls School District experience. And that's how we keep working on that. So that's mentoring of another kind too. It's often somebody at consistency of an adult who cares and knows me. And um, one of my friends is a superintendent in another district and one of their district guarantees is that every student will be known by uh, name and strength I think is how they characterize it and that means you know some kids I know some kids you know some kids but as a staff they all see that that's part of their mission yeah good other questions comments that's how we get to be that um, we are just about at 3.30, and we're going to kind of blend this part into kind of the next leg of our discussion, which is right now, is there anything that, you know, we kind of see that we need to say, okay, we want to make sure that that's either already reflected or we want it to be reflected, and then we'll move that over into Todd's realm of, and then what does that mean for budget considerations? So. While I get up um, Todd's set of slides, why don't we take a 10 minute break and I'll get that set up and then we'll kind of move into that next part of our discussion.
next piece will will merge into the budget piece but when you think before we talk about money um, just thinking about the recap of the priorities kind of the document as it, as it is right now we don't have to you know change anything right now but what we have to start doing at this point is kind of anticipating if there's anything that we'll want to because we'll want to take care of that later this spring and we, we can get, you know, all the way through the budget cycle. We can modify that document anytime we want to, but of course we'll want it set for the next year like we did it this way. So when you think about that, is there anything that's kind of a glaring missing piece? We noted maybe the stronger language about mentoring. We're going to articulate. I think we need to do a little bit more about the after school kind of community model. Other things that kind of come to mind that we want to make sure is reflected in there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in reading um, the media releases and listening, you know, to the news, this certainly isn't specific just to Sioux Falls. Um, but as Americans, we consistently say our future is our children. But yet, we're not necessarily putting our dollars where those remarks fall. And that's specifically two areas. Number one, teacher pay. Number two, early um, childhood. And we're certainly feeling that here in Sioux Falls and in South Dakota, <coughs> as is the rest of the nation. Um, but I think we really need to be conscientious about how you're paying those uh, direct support providers, specifically in those two areas, with their public education and then number two, um, early childhood. Mm -hmm. So if we could have some language that's specific to that, in that we'll have negotiations coming up in March. Just language, not financial this yeah, round. Language, mm -hmm. right. um, like, you know, I, you know. And I think I think that's there when we talk about the, the retention piece. The early childhood part is reflected in there, so we've got that. So we'll take a look at that. If there's a strong connection to retention mm -hmm. um, and teacher pay as just evidenced in research, and I think Becky has had some Mm-hmm. Agreed. In, in addition to the pay, I think it's been um, wonderful that through our extra ESSER funds, we have been able to maintain a smaller class size than we did pre-COVID, um, <clears throat> even though enrollments uh, had gone down. So I would love, because as we know, that is also important, is uh, class size and mm -hmm. the ability for classroom management, and especially with the increased behaviors and so forth. So if it could be continued um, to maintain this where we are um, mm -hmm. through the COVID era of that class size going out, out of that era. And that's a key thing that you just mentioned there that I think we all have to be keeping in mind is right now while we have ESSER dollars and ARPA and every other acronym, those dollars will get pulled back eventually. And so we want to get the biggest bang that we can, which is that training, it's the added staff, it's the added kind of emphasis on um, reading and math, but we also have to be planning for when those ESSER dollars come away from our district, just like everybody else. And so what are we doing to make sure that we're cultivating so our enrollment stays on a healthy trajectory, our programs are enhanced, we're attracting families that come new to our school district to choose public education. So um, we have to keep remembering those dollars are right now, but they're not forever. And so those are the things that if we prioritize things like class size, teacher pay and retention, compensation for staff that we've raised everybody pretty much this year, last year and a half, um, we have to be able to sustain that then too in the future. And how do we make sure that we're planning ahead for that? Yeah. Okay, other priority language when you think about just kind of the totality of those big areas that we know we have? And if you think of things, email them to us and say, oh, this is something, you know, or it's kind of emerged or, you know, I've been thinking about this since mid-year and it's March and something comes to mind. We can always bring that up, but any other glaring pieces kind of right now?
okay, well, that's easy. We've got a lot in there. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is we went through a lot of process last year to get these down, and most of them we need to just continue and, you know, let them play out over a series of years for full implementation. Um, or we've got some, you know, good significant progress, but we're not ready to take it out of a priority status yet. So that's perfectly fine and probably the way that it should be. So with that, I'm going to log back in here. So Todd can um, remind us of budget process. Wow. This is a big deal to be able to cast wirelessly because I haven't been able to do this successfully yet. This is what we want our teachers to be able to do so that we can walk into a classroom or a library or anywhere we are and be able to, to do this. So this is fun. And I would um, ask that the budget red flag not be red because we're not going to be the red. <laughs> so already got me in our master document. We have to stay with our theme colors. <laughs> That's true, yes. We won't hopefully have that metaphor. All right, so when we think about, yeah, when we think about our priorities, we also then have to think about, is there anything else that we, um, you as board members, this is kind of your opportunity to make sure that Todd and our departments are thinking about it as we go into that budget process of saying, here's what we think we're going to keep prioritizing and here's what we want to make sure that we're still um, looking at for funding. We've added a lot of things and I know some of the things that are near and dear to your hearts, we've been, you know, looking at and weaving in. JAG is a great example of that, and expanding that next year means that we have to invest in that. Um, as we get feedback from our community forums, I think we'll do a debrief kind of after we get through a couple more of those, but language supports, customer service, when you call into our district, can you easily get the information you need if English isn't your first language? Um, the hub area that we've started to build out at Axtell Park, that's really successful. But as we look at how we build that out in all of our schools with that after school model, um, how do we you know, make sure that we're doing that well and what does that look like over time? So those are things that I think we've got in motion and as they're successful, then we're gonna have to wrestle with how do we keep investing while also looking at our overall budget. If we build it, then we have to not tear it back down. All right, Todd, you want to review our budget process? Yeah, so we went over this in uh, our first meeting in November. This is just kind of a refresher of that. Maybe I added a few things in that weren't on that timeline back then. So here's where we're at. Uh, as of last Friday, really technically Sunday, we asked everybody to, to, to get us what their level fours would be. So level fours, if you recall, is just what, what will it cost next year to do what we're doing this year? So we can get a baseline and, and see where we're at. Um, so we'll, we'll be able to add that up this week and, and get a total on that because everybody got that in over the, sometime last Friday over the weekend or what whatnot. Now I got to add in uh, estimated salary increases and things like that to those numbers. And we'll total that up. We can take a look at that and we can go over that with the budget committee when we meet for the audit sometime later this month. But uh, so that's for something that's, to look forward to. That's yeah. For, yeah. Right. Um, you guys right now identifying budget priorities um, that you're interested in. Tomorrow, a group of uh, central leadership team members will go through and review all the expansions. We asked everybody to turn in all their, their expansions. We'll review those. Um, these priorities we talked about today, uh, we'll, we'll look at general fund and SPED and, and then the ESSER budget prepares to see what can fit into ESSER and then of course whatever that is we're going to have to meld into the five-year plan because the five-year plan is past the end of ESSER funding so we'll, we'll have to be able to do that as well. Um, by the end of January we're asking everybody to have their first draft of all their budgets completed so we can go through and look and look for continuity and making sure Make sure that everything makes sense, right? If you've moved out a position to another cost center, that cost center has that position in it, things like that. So we'll review that at the end of January. Um, so then kind of have February to, to make finalized 
changes and whatnot. All, fi all budgets are due then the beginning of March on the 4th. Then on the 10th, it's not really a budget issue except for the, the parentheses there, but the main run of the session ends, and at that point we should have a good idea, a really good idea of what state aid's gonna be. And that, of course, drives our revenue projections. So we'll know that at that time. And then the, uh, a week later, the Budget Review Committee, uh, that includes two members of this board are on it, and I think most of the people, and most of the administrators in the room, maybe not Brett, are on it as well. We go through, bring all these budgets together, prioritize them, and then make a recommendation for the full board. And then, uh, so then we have public meetings. So then March 30th is the first of those where we go through all that stuff so everybody can just, can uh, find out what's being proposed as the recommended budget. And then you can marinate on that for a week, and uh, the public can as well. Then we come in and then have a follow-up to that in another work session where we can get in depth on any of the issues you might have. We can bring in other administrators, you know, the administrators that have prepared the budgets if you guys have questions about that. Hopefully get all that squared away, final, final recommendations put in place. Then we hold the public hearing on the 11th. Um, of course, uh, more, more public commentary on that that day as well. Um, adopt a tentative budget so we can start uh, filling positions for next year and all that good stuff. Becky's always interested in that. And then, uh, then on the 11th, uh, the first, the annual meeting for the new year is where you, you finalize that tentative budget. There'll be probably a few changes that will have caught some mistakes and stuff, but that'll be approved by the board on the 11th. So that's our timeline going forward from today. Questions about the timeline or process? Board member uh, Baker and Ryder are the two board members who would serve on the committee, but obviously we all, as board members, have to be here. Yep. So when you think about those two things now kind of blended together, is there anything else like for budget priorities that you want to make sure that we put on the list for one department or another as we're looking at what that budget's going to take shape as for next year? You know, for me, it's are we teaching kids to be successful? Reading, writing, math, all those things. We address that in our priorities, which will be reflected in our budget, especially through the SIPs and everything that you've added in middle school mm -hmm. there. Um, <coughs> and pay and what our environment is in our buildings. And I think we've addressed that through our priorities and hopefully then will be reflected in our um, budget. And the one thing I didn't see on there is um, we also don't we also ask if there's any places where the staff feels like items could be cut as well within the budget too I, oftentimes that we don't have that they don't answer that but we do look for inefficiencies or things that need mm -hmm. to be removed as well through the budget as well that is, uh, that's correct and we have and we always you know we, when we budget we have the we talk about the fourth level but the, the first three are are cuts leading up to that a 90 percent or 95% and then a 98%. Um, so yeah, we all, we're always looking for that. I think the one thing that um, I would maybe add, and I don't know how what it would look like or cost or anything like that, but we talk about our activities being an extension of our classrooms. And so I'm wondering, you know, we talk about the importance of mentoring and we talk about the importance of interactions that our kids have. And so as we look to have more of our students participate in after school activities at the middle school level, how are we mentoring and how are we preparing our staff that are coaches at middle school and high school level to be a good coach and to be able to work with students and work with parents and work with whatever that might entail. And I know, you know we have a lot of new coaches in the district with having um, Jefferson and those might not all be new to coaching, but I, see, I think that actually adds some depth that maybe we could have shared experiences oh, yeah. just because you're in one building doesn't mean you can't work with somebody who's in another building so mm -hmm. how are we looking at that type of mentoring program or that type of development I know it's not a classroom but I think those roles are still really important because mm -hmm. um, they work with kids who are typically passionate about something um, and so how can we harness that passion and help them to be their best at that which might help them improve in school as well mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you want to talk about that, yeah. Jamie? Those are probably some of the best toughest dirty to do finally. Yeah. For those kids, especially at that level, middle school kids. Yeah. Those are things that happen. Mm -hmm. Get them involved early, help them get a love for it, and connect to the people who are in that, which are going to be positive people in their life. And then as they get to high school, they're going to want to participate in those activities. And I only have my experience at Lincoln, but you know there are some activities that we hardly have enough people sometimes to participate. So what can we mm -hmm. do to, to really build that at a middle school level, which I love the busing options, and I love trying to remove some of those barriers. But then once we get them there, how are we gonna keep them there? Because they're engaged and they want to participate. Plus from a health perspective, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're exercising, they're socializing, they're not sitting at home on a phone or a tablet or a whatever, mm -hmm. and, you know, whatever. So I just think that those, that's a, an area we haven't really talked about specifically, but it's something I would like to see added in some capacity. Yeah. We did look through and, and completed a survey with students and, and uh, some of the staffing as well, but one of the primary things that came back with the students is the esports. Now there's multiple other things, you know, in the middle school, the dance, cheer, soccer, um, you know, in the high school, obviously, with softball. But there's multiple things that came through that. Some of that you'll see coming through the budget process as well, and, and we'll meet on parts of that to talk about it in the expansion, because those would be expansion packets. Mm -hmm. Another area that we had talked about and, and met with Casey Miley on is, is uh, getting a coach preparation, especially for new coaches, a mentoring program going on that. And so we've talked through part of that as well. Sure. So there are gonna be some things that'll come through the, the budget process that way to how do we help to get more uh, students involved at the high school level and at the middle school level. And then uh, the state's looking at it as probably a two year process, not next year, but the year after for eSports and whether that becomes sanctioned at that point in time and our district looking at that as, as well. But that was by far the number one request um, but how do we get kids involved because you know when we look at each one of the high schools and we track the number of kids that are involved and how they do academically uh, behaviorally attendance all those factors it, it's far superior to those that are not involved mm -hmm. and we just got to make sure we have an avenue for them within a kid and what they want to be involved in mm -hmm. instead of what we want them to be involved in but right. what they want to be involved in and so we have been looking at that and some of those things will come forward in in this year's and some of it will be in next year's yeah, and those are significant investments. Mm -hmm. That's, um, you know, we're, we're starting to hear that. I mean, I don't think it's new, but I've, I've probably heard it more this year, and maybe it's just because we're out and about a little differently at, at sports um, events. And we've had kind of the recalibration from the boundary changes, and you add a new middle school, and you add a new high school, and kind of the reshuffling that comes with that. But the impact of club sports on high school sports and kids want to be involved in something but they don't all want to be in a competitive sanctioned sport they want to play soccer but they don't want to be on the high school soccer team or they want to you know do an activity but they don't want to do it all year or you know in the same way and they, yeah exactly so I think with the after school model and investing in the sanctioned sports the goal is to have more things for kids to do after school and then if it's district funded or if we have to find funding in some other ways. I think there's interest um, on the part of our community too to help with some of that, but we want kids to have a good place to go. I've heard that, and, and a lot of them want um, you know, more opportunities like a book club, or our middle schoolers want more personal finance, which cracked me up, and I've heard it at three middle schools now. I think part of that is you, know, you can get an app now, and you can track your earning and your spending in different ways if you're a student and they want to know more about that. They're ready to invest in the stock market, I think, even though they don't know they're not old enough. Exactly, and so it's a different picture. So how do we capture that? And some of that is an enrichment layer in those after school programs and some of it is more wrestling. Mm -hmm. He's being nice and not mentioning it down there. We know, but that's good. <laughs> yeah, I know, but it's that's just one of the pieces of, of those opportunities. So I'm glad you brought that up because we'll have to walk that line of what can we add that's responsibly added and sustainable over time while we're still trying to make sure that core school day is in good shape and that's where those tough decisions come in for a board. Well I think it's important to add um, and add quality not just to add for quality's right. purpose you know so we want to make sure we have good mm -hmm. people who can 
who are committed and invested and want to make a program successful or a team or whatever it is and not just add stuff because we think we can hire somebody or we, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like sometimes that, it's a hard yeah. thing. Um, it's not, no matter how bad you want something, it's still important you have somebody that's going to kind of champion that and, and be a good person for the people who want yeah. to be involved. So definitely a balance. Yeah, good. And do it long term. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Good, what else? Good point. Pretty easy, man. Good. I think we've got a lot of things in process that we are we feel good about. So um, we'll see how things come forward, and we'll go from there with the process. Anything else on budget? Just for the business side of budget. Okay. So yeah. Some bills have been introduced early. Are there any budget bills with the state that are in the The governor's proposal for 6% that that bill's filed. Yeah. Do you have a motion to adjourn? Oh, yeah, we should do that. Motion. Second. A motion to second. All those in favor of adjournment signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed to sign. We are adjourned.